did something very natural, talk about the, the rich and poor in, in this era, in this age, in this time. So every, in everyday life, we always encounter those kind of who is rich, who is poor, and why kind of question almost every day. It's quite natural to create those kind of story as a contemporary filmmaker. Wang Junho's filmography is an introspective look at humanity's failings. The critically acclaimed director of Memories of a Murder, Snowpiercer, and the global smash Parasite has never shied away from criticizing our shortcomings and their effects at large as they permeate throughout our dealings with family, society, and each other. We'll look at some of the key motifs of his works and the story that Junho is telling us about human nature and his critique on the myth of progress. In comparison with the Genesis story, the modern myth in which humanity is marching toward a better future is mere superstition. If we have more than before, it means only that we have a greater scope to enact our madness. The message of Genesis is that the most vital areas of human life there can be no progress, only an unending struggle with our nature. John Gray, The Silence of Animals. In the writings of John Gray, which we'll use to analyze these films, he challenges that these ideas of reason, science, progress, aim to rid us of our true nature. The reason why these higher pursuits fail us in our quest to evolve beyond the animal, they are just crutches to hide from the truth, that we are at our core animals that have no purpose, stranded on a rock that we're actively trying to break, hurtling past celestial bodies into a meaningless ether. Bong Joon-ho corroborates this theory in his works to show how despite our best efforts and intentions, the underlying motives often have more to do with the natural inclination towards satisfying animalistic urges. Power, dominance, territoriality, groupthink are all examples of this thought process. We'll explore this further in our examination of his work and the differing conflicts of man that he explores through our struggles in our relationship with society, nature, and self. These conflicts are interweaved through his films as either the explicit struggle of the protagonists or implicitly through their environment and situation. In the dystopian worlds of Snowpiercer and Okja, we see the effect of humanity on the environment, with one displaying an inhospitable world as the outcome of our wars and climate change. Humanity finds itself trapped in the perpetual motion machine of oppression. Snowpiercer is set within the confines of the unstopping machine of industrialism characterized by the train Snowpiercer, designed by an enigmatic billionaire. We see the necessity of our society to run off the backs of the lower class. Rinsing and repeating the same cycle of exploitation is Junho's reflection of the current state of economics and consumerism, with classes split distinctly into the haves and have-nots. Not so nearly as black and white as a train compartment, but the outcome being the death of innocence and the perpetuation of endless greed. It is a world that's carefully crafted by the elite to maintain a semblance of order. 2017's Okja, on the other hand, fleshes out this greed in its corporate attire, with the Monsanto Standard Mirando Corporation looking to solve world hunger through the breeding of super pigs. And then we got one. Say hello to a super piglet. Genetically modified to satiate humanity's bottomless consumption. Highlighting general practices that take place in the meat industry where we get our happy meals, Junho humanizes Okja as the millions of livestock we exploit similarly to the tail enders in Snowpiercer. The fictional Mirando Corporation echoing the eco-friendly rebranding efforts that the company is looking to curry favor with the general public. Looking at you, Uncle Ben and Aunt Jemima. With this image in mind, the company makes efforts to incorporate the innocent Mija as a part of their marketing efforts, taking advantage of the real relationship between the girl and her pet to mask their true intentions. This is the tokenizing nature of these types of marketing efforts. The best super pig on the face of the earth! Looking to promote equity and diversity to virtue signal when the true practices of the organization go entirely against any virtue. Worse yet, it is a perversion of the love between two characters as their love is materialized, packaged, and sold to the masses for consumption. Alive. 
the most important takeaway in these films is the lack of any sort of correcting of the root causes of these issues by the ones involved. By attacking the front enders of the train, the lower class look to become the new stewards. Thus, they will become the perpetrators of abuse, doling out oppression. A similarity we find in history is the French Revolution, which mirrors many of the events in Snowpiercer. The lower class uprisings, which are flared by the hopes of enlightenment thinkers and arbiters of reason, soon succumb to the chaos and greed they hope to vanquish. Idealists at the forefront of the movement became mass murderers, lowering themselves below their rivals as they positioned themselves in seats of power. In Okja, although Mirando is exposed, they provide society with its desires, and because of our lack of moral fiber, no pun intended, will continue to munch on whatever rebrand is able to sell their image better. Alright, I'll stop with the puns. The synthesis of old Mirando and new Mirando was impeccable. I took nature and science and I synthesized and everyone loved it. Humans think they are free, conscious beings, when in truth they are deluded animals. At the same time, they never cease trying to escape from what they imagine themselves to be. Today, when politics is unconvincing even as entertainment, science has taken on the role of mankind's deliverer, John Gray, Straw Dogs. In both prior films, we've created societies that value our conflict. Snowpiercer, although quite heavy-handed, was specifically around classism and class warfare. These themes are more subtly examined in the film Parasite, where we follow the Kim family's infiltration of high society through their relationship with the wealthy Park family. Upon learning of a tutoring opportunity with the Parks, the son jumps at the chance to con his family into the home of the Parks. This first instance of deceit against the Parks is a first critique against the roots of the society. Despite the image of the members of the Kim family as capable employees, their social status would cause them to not be considered for the roles. Critiquing nepotism, it is considered a con when the poor engage in it. They use their new jobs to level up from their current stations as cellar dwellers considered by society as no more than pests or parasites, completing their infiltration of upper-class life. More stuff won't make you more happy. The process of acquiring it might make you feel more important or that you're keeping up with people, but it's not what this elusive will-o'-the-wisp strange thing called happiness consists in. That wealth, which really also means independence, a sense of freedom from want, is not from a multitude of possessions, but it's from a, a liberty or a wealth in the soul. Kim Ki-woo begins a relationship with the Park daughter, showing that qualitatively, he fits her needs and desires under the facade. However, in the quantitative world that creates such distinctions, he is sorely lacking. If you look, there's a wonderful book on this topic written by a French scholar and intellectual called René Guénon, which is called The Reign of Quantity. And in that book, he talks about the idea of moving away from a quality-based culture into a quantity-based culture. And he considers that what the Hindus called the Kali Yuga period, the last period of man on earth, that it would be a period of great disruption and turmoil, that there would be a massive upheaval of traditional models and a radical new uh, type of way of looking at the world which is related more to quantity than quality. And, and it's interesting, there's an uh, you know, the idea, one of the things that we as a Western people have done, which is quite unique and a radical departure from traditional cultures, is the quantification of everything. You know, we, we've really set out to measure everything. His sister, the capable intelligent Kim Ki Jung, has the easiest time fitting amongst the high crowd, her brother noticing how well she fits into their group. This is confirmed by the trust that the park matriarch displays, letting Kim Ki Jung support her traumatized son. The Park family's son's traumatization is also symbolic, which is due to his exposure to the lower class, impelling the boy to adopt a Native American attire, potentially symbolizing his return to natural or primordial state. On the opposite end, his parents fetishize poverty as they roleplay the exotic and fantastical world of the lower class. The trivialization of the Kim family's struggles are on full display as they objectify poverty, highlighting their ignorance to the realities that the Kims must face every day. Yet their world can't function without the multitude of Kim serving their whims, their daughter's education, son's art therapy, general sustenance and upkeep, even the light that guides their steps, are entirely dependent on these people they disdain and dismiss. Jun Ho is asking us, the viewer, 
who are the real parasites. Humankind's presence on Earth is nothing but a cancer. John Gray, Straw Dogs. His film The Host is the mirror of parasite in both theme and symbolism. In The Host, the monster symbolizes nature perverted by man. From the ooze of toxic waste, the host is born, and it is humans that are the cancer. Whereas Parasite is humanity's self-destruction due to losing their grip on nature, furthering themselves away from their natural inclination through the chase of money and social status, the end of Parasite has us see the families revert to their destructive, animalistic nature. And very often it's the oligarchs who have you know, the most counselling sessions and the weirdest families and uh, issues at that kind of level of sort of mega rich, uh, ultra rich is a uh, kind of well known, it's a very dysfunctional world just as Hollywood is a dysfunctional world, just as Wall Street is a very dysfunctional world, <laughs> humanly speaking. The patriarch of the Kim family succumbs completely to his animal self, shunning any pretense found in the chase for progress. He slinks back into the basement to take the place of the now dead predecessor, content to spend his days in the darkness of the Park household. His misguided son looks to free his father from the shackles of his self-imposed exile. Little does he know what he's seeking is the perpetuation of the same system that trapped his father in the basement. Uh, and this is of course quite a challenge to certain modern materialist assumptions about what makes human beings happy. Uh, but the reality is if you look at, for instance, the global survey on uh, mental health that recently came, uh, came out that was reported in the UK press last week, uh, where they're looking at uh, the percentage of populations in different parts of the world that suffer from anxiety and depression. Uh, generally, there is a positive correlation between uh, GDP and levels of anxiety and depression. The promise of wealth is the poison that trapped the elder Kim in the cellar. A common deceit in the materialist worldview is the elevation of certain members to seek to become members of high society to continue the same destruction of the majority. The one overtaking the many. Basically, human beings will find their own level of happiness uh, even if they have recently been subjected to some disastrous bereavement or uh, so within a year, um, I think this was maybe a Harvard or a Boston University survey, uh, happiness levels of people who have won the lottery and those who have had multiple amputations, after 12 months they're more or less the same. So all of this of course is a big challenge to the materialistic dream that there is such a thing as progress, that we're getting more comfortable, that we're getting happier, that uh, in the upper Paleolithic, people were really miserable and anxious and depressed. But in fact, the reality is likely to be that the nearer we are to living in the kind of ecosystem and social environment that's, that's normal to us as a species, the more likely we are to be well-adjusted and happy in, in, in that sense. You'll know that even if it's your responsibility to earn a living and to put your kids through the right kind of schools and so forth, that's not really what's going to make you happy or at ease or mm. keep you free of these sort of sort of pandemic scaled modern mental health conditions. That's going to come from faith, from optimism, from family, from connection to nature, connection to beauty and to being a kind of normal primordial human being, if you like. It's got nothing to do with what's in your bank account. I personally don't consider Junho a nihilist in the same sense as John Gray. However, his work does show a lack of faith in the systems and thinking that have facilitated a world of oppression, mental illness and self-destruction. Yes, I mean, I once uh, arrived at Heathrow with a Mauritanian scholar who'd never been to the West before. And when we were at the airport and we took public transport, I was feeling cheap. <laughs> um, he asked me, has there been some catastrophe, some caritha? Because everybody in the tube was looking kind of worried and unhappy. They all looked kind of yeah. as if some, so the, an, an imminent asteroid impact was threatening the planet. They look really worried. In his village in Mauritania, where people don't have anything, they have to walk a mile for water, everybody's kind of smiling and the women are laughing and it's, yeah. it's cheerful. <laughs> uh, and this, of course, is a very subversive uh, realisation, although it's kind of obvious, you travel a bit and you see it, to the whole idea that there must be growth and there must be progress and we must get richer and we must buy more stuff and consume more stuff and throw away more stuff. It's, it's the precise opposite of both the socialist and the capitalist model, which all assume that human beings are greedy and will be happy when their greed is satisfied. Mm. The last shot of his films tell a different story. 
and they're usually the same, with the characters staring into a distance, trying to understand their reflection in the audience. He shows us what he considers to be of value in these shots, which is the essential thing humanity possesses, the ability to connect with other people, foster community, relationships, and above all, family. It is no surprise that the survivors in his films are the ones that prioritize the existence of family. In Okja, Mija stares into the distance, smiling at the return of her companion. In Snowpiercer, a clairvoyant child survives a derailed train wreck, symbolizing the overcoming of the spiritual against the material. As the machine comes to a halt, it's the metaphysical that has outlasted the physical. It is these families staring into the emptiness of wilderness, a blanket of snow to show new beginnings, new respect, and hopefully a new path. Bong Joon-ho explores our humanity in these shots, and his hope is that we will leave the material behind to embrace the spirit, family, and those connections that are above the tangible, the qualitative over the quantitative. We simply have to shut down the mega machine. Nice. Thanks for watching. As always, like and subscribe if you enjoy the content. Follow me on socials pinned in the comments below, and support me on Patreon as well to improve this channel. All the links are in the description. Thank you for watching.